Welcome to the program. We call this program Pope Francis Teaching on Wealth. And I'm privileged today to have an interview with Paul Flynn from Dublin, Ireland, where he will ask me questions about Pope Francis teaching on wealth. And we will be able to critique precisely in biblical terms what is God's view on wealth and human responsibility. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. This is Paul Flynn with Megiddo Radio for the 14th of July, 2014. Thank you for everybody for tuning in. We are joined today by Richard Bennett of Breen Beacon. Org. Now, we just want to read out some of his biography for those of you who, who may not be aware of Richard Bennett's ministry. Now, the Jesuits trained Richard in, the, in his early years in Belvedere College on Great Denmark Street. Richard then received eight years of theological instruction and preparation for the priesthood with the Dominicans, completing his education at the Angelicum University in Rome in 1964. He spent 21 years as a Catholic priest in Trinidad, West Indies, 20 years of which he served as a parish priest. After a curious accident in 1972 in which he nearly lost his life, he began to steer seriously study the Bible, which eventually led him to away from Romanism. And then it said, after nearly 14 years of contrasting Catholicism to biblical truth by the, Lord Jesus, by the Lord God's grace, Richard looked to him by faith alone for the salvation that alone, that, that gives alone. Now, we have spent a number of sh shows dealing with the economic views of Pope Francis and also Thomas Aquinas, and someone who has spent a long time studying these issues is Richard Bennett. Now, Richard Bennett has come across the writings of Thomas Aquinas, and this is especially why I wanted to get him on the show to add to his exp expertise and the number of shows we've already done around Roman Catholicism, Romanism, and their view of economics, and how it is uh, very much different to what the Bible teaches. Richard, um, Richard has spent a long time studying Thomas Aquinas, who so he said, and I want to look at the collectivist leanings of Rome here. Now, Richard, before we discuss uh, the teachings of Pope Francis, and uh, before we get into it, welcome to the show. Nice to be with you, and I thank God for this opportunity, Paul. It's great to have you on the show, Richard. Before we get into the teachings of Pope Francis, because I know you've done a lot of research on this issue, now, could you tell our listeners something about Thomas Aquinas, those who haven't heard much about him. Yes, just to put a personal note in, as you said, I had studied Aquinas. I studied uh, Aquinas for four years. We actually brought the Summa Theologica, his main work, to class, and we studied the actual text from Aquinas, and I did that for uh, four years. Um, Aquinas himself was a brilliant man with an extraordinary intellect. He's been called in the Catholic Church the Angelic Doctor. He was born in 1225 and he died in 1274. He was first of all educated by the Benedictine monks in Monte Cassino in Italy and it was there that he came to know of a man who influenced his wife, his life, very, very deeply and that was Aristotle, the pagan philosopher who had lived about 300 years before Christ and he came to know Aristotle. He was in 1244 made regent of studies in, in um, Naples in Italy and then he began his most famous work, the Summa Theologica. And he uh, held many things in the, the Summa Theologica. One of the key factors is to see what Aquinas held regarding how man's intellect is always precise and accurate. He held that even though mankind had fallen after the sin of Adam, it did not affect the human intellect. 
and it was always accurate regarding what Aquinas called first principles. I'd like to quote exactly from the Summa Theologica where it says, quotation, the intellect is always right regarding first principles since it is not deceived about them for the reason that it is not deceived about what a thing is. And he quotes from Aristotle many times in the Summa Theologica and Aristotle also believed that the intellect was supreme and that you could know God and you could prove his existence from the intellect alone. And so this is what um, Aquinas went on to believe that by the intellect alone you could know God. And uh, it's Very quite dangerous teaching, isn't it, Richard? I beg your pardon? A very dangerous teaching, isn't it's it? It's a very dangerous teaching, <laughs> but it has become it has become official in the Catholic Church and the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the modern day official teaching in paragraph forty nine, we have the following statement quotation The Church teaches that the one true God, our Creator and Lord, can be known with certainty from his works by the natural light of human reason. That is the official words of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So you can see Aquinas' teaching coming out in modern-day Romanism, and uh, he has been called by uh, Pius XI in, in uh, 1923 the, the one whom all students for the priesthood must look to in their preparation for the priesthood, and he's, he's quoted uh, uh, many times, for example, on this section of the Catechism, the dignity of the human person, we find Aquinas quoted from three times. So it is, uh, it is um, quite strange because Aquinas had a dramatic happening in his life, and it was before he had finished writing his this famous manual, the Summa Theologica, he experienced a divine revelation whereby he apprehended that all his writings were worth straw compared to who God is. And um, that was just in the late months of, of 1273 and 1274, he died. I beg your pardon. It shows you the absolute uh, real danger, whether it's by kind of, we, you could call it almost charismatic style experiences, or by using the human intellect and relying on human reason. The Bible says not to trust in our own reason, but to lean upon the Lord's. And it just shows you the importance of that practically when you study these men. And it, it also shows you too, you know, when, as you've done, Richard, yourself, studying back through uh, the doctrines of what Pope Francis is teaching, especially in the media, and you, and you trace it back, um, it's really nothing new, as you've, as you've pointed out. Uh, Richard, can you explain to our audience where the teachings of Pope Francis can be found? Yes, they can be found on the uh, Vatican webpage. If you go there, um, you can find the lengthy document where he talks about many other things. It's a very lengthy document and he calls the whole document the joy of the gospel. And among many other topics, as I say, he discusses wealth, but he is emphatic in what he says about wealth. And so I'd like to read from section 57, and I'm giving the exact words as it is on the Vatican webpage. He says the following, Ethics, a non-ideological ethics, would make it possible to bring about balance and a more humane social order. With this in mind, I encourage financial experts and political leaders to ponder the words of one of the sages of antiquity. Not to share one's wealth with the poor is to steal from them and to take away their livelihood. It is not our own goods which we hold, but theirs. 
End of quotation. Now talk about the conclusion there. Not our goods which we hold, but theirs. You do not own your own goods, as it were, or this, he's saying, but it belongs to the poor. And an actual it's an astonishing fact, thing, because like, it just shows you why um, he's been so associated with Marxism. Yes, and we'll see more about that later on and how it has yeah. translated into this. Absolutely. He actually is he's not quoting from Thomas Aquinas, but Thomas Aquinas wrote about this, and I want to mm. read exactly what Aquinas said. And listen exactly, because this is quite horrendous what Aquinas said. Quotation, in cases of need, all things are common property, so there would seem to be no sin in taking another's property, for need has made it common. It is lawful for a man to succor his own need by means of another's property. By taking it either openly or secretly, nor is this, properly speaking, theft or robbery. <laughs> so, you can take somebody else's property if you're in need and you can do it secretly or openly and it's not robbery, it's not theft. The commandment not oh, that's to... That's absolutely horrendous. How serious, Richard, is this in your estimation? It is, it is, it is really serious when you consider the position of um, Francis, because he is speaking to a audience of Catholics who obey him and call him the Holy Father, the Vicar of Christ, and he is lording it over 1.2 billion people worldwide, and in the United States, 63 million Catholics here in the United States. So we must realize that if he's teaching this, that this is going to have an effect on societies and governments and how people live. And uh, so it's, um, it is really serious because it translates into everyday life. And um, I had seen this, and I'll talk about it later on as a priest, when I was in Trinidad and tried to obey this sort of teaching. And it is, it is, brings about horrendous um, results. And um, Francis goes on to quote again from what is actually going to be uh, the compendium of Catholic social, uh, of the social teaching of the Catholic Church. You can find this on the Vatican website if you go to the compendium of social teaching of the Church. And let me read, first of all, before I read what Francis said, let me read what the compendium, this is the official teaching of the Catholic Church in its compendium says. Christian tradition has never recognized the right to private property as absolute and untouchable. On the contrary, it has always understood this right within the broader context of the, of the right common, the right common to all to use the goods of the whole of the whole of creation the right to private property is not subordinated to the right of uh, common use to the fact that the goods that goods are meant for everyone let me read that section again Christian tradition has never recognized the right to private property as absolute and untouchable. On the contrary, it has always understood this right within the broader context of the right common to all to use the goods of the whole creation. The right to private property is subordinated to the right to common use, to the fact that goods are meant for everyone. The principle of the universal destination of goods is an affirmation both of God's full and perennial lordship over every reality and the requirement that goods of creation remain ever destined to the development of the whole person and of all humanity. 
So goods are meant for everyone, the eternal uh, destination of goods. And uh, so this Even is the term uh, universal destination of goods has been used by I've heard it being used by many different popes, Pope John Paul II. So again, it shows how no, none of this is really new. It's not new. It's, uh, Francis is actually saying what popes have said before, like John Paul II and others. They have emphasized this idea that everything really belongs to, to, to the, the whole of humanity. And uh, if um, your private property does not really belong to you, absolutely, it uh, should be ab able to be destined uh, to give to the poor. I wanted to read now where Francis used the exact phrase that the uh, compendium uses, and this is in paragraph 169 of his document. He says the following, Solidarity is a spontaneous reaction by those who recognize that the social function of property and the universal destination of goods are realities that come before private property. Solidarity must be lived as the decision to restore to the poor what belongs to them. So this is going back to the idea of Aquinas to give to the poor what belongs to them and that uh, private property, you may think it is a basic uh, right that the Western society has always held dear, but not the Catholic Church. and. Uh, this is what Francis says, and I, I think that people must realize, to wake up and see just exactly what he says and how these things can translate into not only revolution, but really depriving people of what is basic to society. Absolutely, Richard, and it's so important as well even to realize that you're quoting from official Vatican documents. You're not quoting from opinions from Catholic writers or what uh, people think Pope Francis has said or anything else, especially when you're quoting from the compendium of the social doctrine of the Church. You're going right to what they state themselves in their own writing. And, and, it, and we, we'd invite anybody to check this out as well. Um, look at the, uh, the canon law. These things are in print. Um, they have them in their own writings. And it just shows you the, the similarities between Thomas Aquinas, the Compendium, uh, Pope Francis' own writings, and almost this kind of collectivism, you know, when you have slogans such as the communist slogan, for each according to his ability, to each according to his need. And, the, and you know, American liberals would have certain slogans like, human rights are more important than property rights. Um, even in, here in Ireland, there's a, there's a group called People Before Profit. So the, this, there's lots of different slogans where this idea that it sounds wonderful, and I, I especially understand it from years ago before I was a Christian, when it sounds like, you know, we're putting people before uh, profit and profiteers and all this, but really it has, a, it has a really ugly side, and more importantly than anything else, a very anti-biblical side, a uh, very anti- um, and, and a violation of the Eighth Commandment, thou shall not steal. Um, so, Richard, what significance do you see in Pope Francis' statement yourself? Yes, I see that, that the, uh, this, this statement is exactly what inspired the Soviet Union back in uh, 1917, where we had uh, the Bolshevik Revolution of Stalin. That's what inspired them. They wanted to give to the people what belonged to them, and it ends up with, of course, a dictatorship where the people are uh, treated so so evilly and uh, brutally murdered um, later on. So it, it it's it, it it's quite it's quite unbelievable. But this is just what it leads to, and. Uh, it, um, it was the same in the North Korea, in China and Cuba. And um, we will see later on as I will talk um, about Venezuela. It's, um, this is what had motivated revolutionaries. And, it, it, and by their fruits you shall know them. We see what these revolutions brought about. The enslavement mm. of people in China to this day and in North Korea and in Cuba. And it's... Uh, it's, it's, um, 
it is evil to say the least and it's um, it's something that we really have to face and we really have to expose and make people know where these principles lead. Um, you have some experience this in yourself, haven't you? In your own background, you mentioned it a number of times, um, liberation theology. In the liberation theology, Francis claims to oppose. Um, can you speak uh, to your own experience and also what experience has liberation theology had over the nations? I, I just even comment on Venezuela. I've, I've met a lot of people in Venezuela over here in Dublin and it's amazing when you talk to them, you know, the Western media will make it sound, you know, what Chavez did is wonderful, and etc. But they're basically saying, well, you don't want what we have <laughs> when you talk to them. So could you just comment on the influence of Aquinas and this thinking that Francis has espoused, this kind of thinking has laid waste, I, I suppose you'd say, in uh, South America, Africa, and wherever else? Yes, um uh, I had um, I had personal um, encounter with uh, with this thought, thought of theology and what we call liberation theology, and I was involved in it in the in the late seventies in Trinidad, where I was a priest uh, in our communities, and I had um, besides one town which was fairly big, I had other communities where I was priest, and we started little uh, basic Christian cell groups and in those groups we were teaching people before we teach you about uh, Catholic dogma we want you to know that you should know what your rights are and that you should have a right to property whereby wealth should not be in the hands of just the wealthy but it should belong to all. In those days, I had a long hair coming down on a dark beard, and I, I would, in my church, I would um, raise my hand and I would say, you know, let us come out of the land of slavery into the land of freedom. We must, we must bring freedom to the peoples, and wealth must be shared by all. And I was giving quotations from the official Catholic teaching about wealth belonging really to all and that um, the idea that wealth had to be shared with all and it was not to belong to some people in particular and that this was my motive and we were leading up to a revolution that actually took place towards the end of the 70s there in Trinidad. But meanwhile uh, there was other revolutions going around and uh, close to Trinidad if you know the geography of that area is uh, Grenada and I had visited Grenada as a priest um, quite a few times and uh, it was um, there that Maurice Bishop, <laughs> a Catholic, re led a revolution based on these principles and the revolution brought in uh, his his dictatorship then of, of the island of Grenada and uh, the people instead of being liberated and getting an equal share in the wealth they became subservient to the government and it was it was frightening I actually went to visit Grenada at that time you know when things calmed down you could get um, um, air flight and I went to visit I had people I knew on the island so places to stay and I went out on the streets and I saw with my own eyes what the state of things was like and talked to people. At street corners there were soldiers with rifle butts and they would buffet people at the street corners and tell them to be careful. And uh, they, people were even like accosted on the streets to be, you know, to, to do what they were told by these soldiers. And then there was the huge prison, and I talked to some people about this huge prison in, in, the, in the capital city whereby people were locked up who opposed this joint ownership of property by the Catholic Maurice B Bishop. And they were locked up, and uh, we do not know what they were suffering in jail, but the jails in Trinidad and in, in, in Venezuela are not like those in the United States or England or Ireland. They are really um, 
horrendous places with uh, where people are maltreated and this was this was frightening because I was talking to the Grenadians there myself and I saw what this revolution had brought about not freedom for the people but the beginning of a dictatorship of Maurice Bishop which was later taken down when the island was freed with the help of the United States but it was um, it was horrendous and I began to have second thoughts about my liberation theology when I saw just how it was lived out and I think it's important for us to understand that Christ Jesus biblical principle is true by their fruits you shall know them we see how these things when they're translated how they affect people and what they bring about it is the it is a fact of history that again in another country Venezuela Hugo Chavez he started his revolution he was a Catholic a devout Catholic he had been actually an altar boy and his mother was hoping he would become a mm. priest <laughs> but he went on to become dictator Really, I, I wasn't aware of that. That Chavez was a devout Romanist, was he? He, he was, yes. And he, uh, he, um, he, he, um, he, um, he was there in Venezuela. Now, we could see from some places of Trinidad, we could see Venezuela. It's a huge country, very, very rich in minerals, and it is one of the big exporting. Uh, um, countries for oil you know petroleum oil and it, it is it, it 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 was very very rich and the people were very well to do in Venezuela when they would visit Trinidad you know we would envy them the people because they were quite well off and when Hugo Chavez took over he became dictator and the people were enslaved to this dictatorship and to this day under Hugo Chavez successor they continue to be oppressed and this is the fruit of this Catholic theology that everything is in public domain that everything belongs to the people because when this is brought to pass it belongs now to a dictator and those who control the the government with him in the dictatorship it's interesting thing too you said you didn't know that Hugo Chavez was a, a Catholic when he was suffering badly you know and he had to go to Cuba for treatment you know he had uh, cancer uh, wasn't it and he was getting treatment in Cuba um, it was at one stage there when he was getting treatment in Cuba that Benedict the 16th visited Cuba and went, wow. to, and went to see Hugo Chavez and uh, he, uh, he actually blessed him and prayed for his recovery and uh, he also gave him a rosary beads <laughs> he could. so Hugo Chavez so could there's be no division between the Venezuelan <laughs> he could be praying to Mary the on the side <laughs> what he was doing is horrendous deed and uh, mm. so it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a um, it's quite a uh, I was remembering this and I went online this morning just to check to see how I got my facts right and it's true there there it was it was um, actually in uh, it was while he was in Cuba that uh, uh, Fidel Castro and his brother Raul Castro was really taken over the um, the uh, control under the dictatorship of of uh, Fidel Castro was taken over under Raul his brother that they went to see Hugo Chavez and you can find a picture on the internet of the three of them <laughs> three Catholics <laughs> Hugo Chavez and Fidel and Raul and when you think of the horrors that these men have done Christ Jesus said by their fruit you shall know them 
we had an old saying, I don't know when I used it, you know, when I was in Trinidad, maybe it's used here in the States and uh, probably in Ireland, and they wake up and smell the coffee. <laughs> you see the Absolutely. facts, man. You know, this, this is the facts. This is the way when these teachings are, are lived out. Let me read again what Francis said, or read what Francis said in paragraph 59 of his document. The poor and poorer peoples are accused of violence, yet without equal opportunities the different forms of aggression and conflict will find a fertile terrain for growth and eventually explode. This is not the case simply because inequality provo provokes a violent reaction from those excluded from the system but because of the socio-economic system is unjust at its core. It's unjust for the wealthy. that's the key term he's using there, that it's unjust. And it's even like that term, you know, like that term that the Jesuits like to use, social justice. Yes, that yes. Does very much tie into that? Yes, it does. And there's a whole, there's a whole, um, the Catholic Church is always talking about social justice. But it's not social justice as we would understand it. It's mm. social justice whereby the poor really have an equal share in all the goods of the community. And uh, it will lead to violence. Why I quoted that paragraph 59 is that France, Francis knew that this is going to bring violence. He knows that it will bring violence. And so why should people listen to Francis when we see how they listen to other popes who thought this, John Paul II, and uh, when we see how, how it has translated and how it has been devastating. Uh, it, was, it was similar in Trinidad when the revolution did take place at the end uh, with the movement which became known as the Black Power Movement, uh, and it was that they did take over the government. And it wasn't until the, in Trinidad that the, uh, the, uh, they took over, I beg your pardon, the army. They took over the army and the army was about to march on the government and take over the capital city, Port of Spain. But before that, <laughs> while, they, while they had taken over the army, the army encampment was close to a hillside and there was one little um, boat belonging to the Trinidad Navy which had a cannon on it and the, it was a, a British commander from the olden days before Trinidad was uh, liberated. He was still uh, working there with Trinidad, now a free nation or independent nation, that he went and cannonballed the hillside and there was an avalanche <laughs> and the, the revolutionary people got stuck. <laughs> They couldn't get out and they couldn't take over the government and uh, that government was eventually, um, the government mm. uh, uh, withstood the revolution and eventually the leaders were tried um, and uh, it's a whole story in itself. But I was there in the midst of all of that revolution and I saw with my own eyes how it affected Trinidad and it was, I have some scary moments even where I was, where the island was under surveillance by troops and uh, before the um, before order was restored and it was um, one of the more frightening times in my own life where you see uh, how uh, this this sort of a revolution how it translates to the ordinary people and it was um, it was um, like a nation without order uh, when uh, for for about five days there in Trinidad, which I lived through. So we see, we see how these things translate, and we have to understand that this is the where Francis's theology is going to lead. If people listen to Francis, and he asks for world leaders to listen to him, and to put it into practice, it's going to bring about horrendous things. Just look at the world, look at the South American nations and see how many nations come under Romanism. Look at the moral state and the sociological state of those nations. It's By the fruits you shouldn't eat them. And, it's, and I think a lot of the terms like 
common good, uh, the common ownership of all goods, common destination of goods. It sounds like, well, everybody's going to get an e- equal piece of the pie. It sounds like that to a lot of people, and I suppose it sounds like fair and justice to, especially to the unregenerate mind. And the thing is, and people have to realize that common good, social justice, whenever you have the, all these things brought in, you're asking for government intervention, and the government must get bigger, and the government must become more totalitarian and more interventionalist. Um, there's an excellent book, actually, that deals with this. is John W. Robbins' book, Ec- uh, Ecclesiastical Megalomania, which deals with a lot of these issues that we've been speaking about on this show, which is uh, I would highly recommend it to a lot of people. Richard, um, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your experiences. I suppose for the people, I suppose we you'll probably be talking to two groups, um, the, the, the Bible believers out there, and I think in the church, I, I, you know, I believe we don't know a lot about this kind of thing. And then there's the unbelieving world. I suppose, how would you conclude after what we've examined from Pope Francis, Thomas Aquinas, what would you like the listeners to take away from this show? Well, I'd like the listeners to take away from the show that Francis is coming out with this declaration on wealth, which you can find on the Vatican website, and asking people to take these principles and put them into operation. In actual fact, what he is doing is just a rehash of what Aquinas said uh, before him, and uh, some things that uh, go back even to Aristotle. You know, it, 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 it's just a rehash. He's not giving anything new. He's just giving old tradition that in the compendium. And he's, this is nothing new. And the results can be seen across the world. Just look at a city even in the United States that is predominantly Catholic. And look at, this, this, the, the, look at the welfare of the people. Look at who's in the jails, look at the moral life of the people. It does not bear fruit. Catholicism Mm. and this teaching does not bear fruit. People are not able to look after their families and really live as they should. So we've got to bring people back to biblical principles that the Lord requires that we be good stewards. There's text after text in the Bible that we are responsible. We're responsible for our goods. We see how land and private property are biblical principles. And we see that we must hold to these things. And if you take away a person's incentive that they can have their own house, their own private property, if you take away these from people, they be just become enslaved to some dictator or some state. And it is It is basic principles we're dealing with. And so we must come back to the basic principles that man is meant to be responsible. He's meant to give an account to God for his stewardship of how he looks after the things that God has given him, how he does his work unto God and to to supply the needs of his family. And then we have true society and true economic and social living and it bears fruit and God is praised. And then we have to get back to the basic spiritual principle that all of us have sin nature and personal sin. And we have to realize as sinners before a holy God, not only is our intellect not perfect as Aristotle would have you to believe and Aquinas would have to believe, but our whole moral life anything but perfect. We are, in the words of Scripture, dead in trespasses and sins. So to look to God of grace, Lord, show me that I'm dead in trespasses and sins. Give me the faith to believe and trust in Christ alone, that I may know what it is to be right with you, and then that I can be right with myself and live a moral life to your glory. And the Lord answers that prayer and you become biblically saved by His grace alone, and you live a moral life and a responsible life, and you can care for your family and care for others. And it is really wonderful in that way, and it would be good to hear from people if, uh, if anybody wants to email. There will be an email address where you can email, and it would be 
great to hear from you because this is important and it comes down to everyday life. And for you, the listener, and for you viewing this program, it's for you to understand God is the God of creation. He is the one who rules the earth. Not some institution called the Catholic Church. Not some dictator who has taken over in the name of the principles of the Catholic Church. It is God who is absolute. His word is true. And when you look to him, he is faithful. And life becomes a joy. A joy unspeakable and full of glory, as the Apostle Peter said. And it is a, a joy to live a good moral life and to be responsible and to have a wife and family and be responsible and see them grow and mature and see that sociological things are working well and that we have come to an understanding of the accountability of men and women to understand the biblical principles of economics and social life. And this is a message that is needed. It's needed in the United States, it's needed in England, it's needed in Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, on and on. And it's needed in Ireland, as you know so well, Paul, from being there. So. This is a message and we say it with joy because it works. Our God is sovereign and his message works and we give him the glory, the praise, the worship and the honor now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Praise God.